Okay, so we are live now. Good evening, everyone. I'm Shruti Chatterjee, and I welcome you all to this panel discussion on cultural identity and ideology curated under TMYS Review in association with Center of South Asian Studies, University of Hawaii. Under this theme, TMYS Review March 2023 will explore the role of community appearance and individual presentation in shaping cultural identity and ideology. I would also like to say that we're calling for submissions of stories, essays, and poems, and for project architecture and submission guidelines, please visit our website, www.tellmeyourstory.biz. Today's topic of discussion is history of Indian clothes and jewelries, functional and aesthetical qualities of clothes and jewelries with specific reference to Indian culture. And we are honored to have with us Dr. Ikta Jain Sethi, Dr. Malini Devakala, Dr. Kruti Dholakia and Vikrant Pandey as our esteemed speakers for this panel discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. Our, uh, I shall now quickly introduce our speakers. Our first speaker for tonight is Dr. Ikta Jain Sethi, ma'am. Dr. Ikta Jain Sethi is an educationist and art consort. She pursued her research work in the field of crafts, education, and development. Her thesis is titled Craft and Fashion, a Sociological Analysis of Chippa Community in Bagru in Rajasthan. She had been actively involved in the multi-volume documentation project of Rashpati Bhavan with IGNCA and Presentation Secretariat. The domain of costume and jewelry is close to her research and passion. She has worked as a grace uh, faculty at prestigious colleges like LSR. Her literary contributions have also been published by Routledge, Orient, Blackstone, and another prominent journals. Our next speaker is Dr. Malini Devakala. Malini Devakala is a dedicated academician with over 27 years of teaching experience. Her interests lie in grooming young professionals in the field of fashion and textile. She is a professor at National Institute of Fashion Technology, Hyderabad. She is passionate about Indian culture and art and is keenly focused to promote and engage in activities involved with promotion of Indian textile crafts. She has published many articles and papers in many national journals. Our third panelist, Dr. Kruti Dholakia. Dr. Kruti Dholakia is inclined towards research and teaching in sustainable system in design, history of textile and clothing. Having more than 15 years of experience now, she has completed projects in the areas of socio-cultural and economic sustainability of traditional crafts, costumes, and sustainable practices, leading home-based businesses, currently serving as an associate professor and cluster initiative coordinator at NIFT Gandhinagar. She holds expertise in formal and informal teaching pedagogy. She has presented and published many papers in reputed international platforms. Our final panelist for today's session, Vikrant Pandey. Vikrant Pandey has still the translated 14 Marathi bestsellers into English. His translation, The Tatas, The Family That Built a Business and the Nation, got the Gaja Capital Business Book Award in 2019. His research book, its recent book in the footsteps of Rama Travels with uh, Ramayana is being made into an OTT serial. He has also written the SBI story, Two Centuries of Banking. Vikrant Pandey is a graduate of IIM Bangalore. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, without further delay, we shall start with our today's session. First, I'd like to request Dr. Ikta Jain Sethi, ma'am, to present your views on today's topic. And I would also like to request to please keep your mic on me, mics on mute while one is speaking. And over to you, ma'am. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Shruti. Thank you for um, such a nice introduction. And um, thank you to all my co-panelists and everyone uh, who's watching us today and uh, is a part of this discussion. Uh, firstly, the, about the topic, like I've been asked to speak uh, 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 at the forefront about history of Indian clothes and jewelries. And I must say at the, at the onset that this is a topic which is really close to my heart. It's... Um, Having worked in this sphere, having done research in this sphere, having been a part of um, uh, the industry of clothing and jewelry um, very closely, I think this is something that um, uh, that I would always want to talk about and discuss about. So I'm really glad to be here. So thank you for this uh, platform. Uh, history of Indian clothes and jewelries. It is a vast topic. It is uh, huge. Like there are so many layers. 
there are so many stories there are so many uh, so many interesting tales that uh, we have heard of that we have read of and there are so many which we yet don't know like there's so much which is yet unexplored um now about me and my role and my understanding of history of indian clothes and jewelry so as shruti mentioned um i've been i've done my phd my doctorate on uh, craft of block printing in bagru uh, in near in rajasthan it's a place in rajasthan near jaipur 30 kilometers from jaipur and uh, it's phd came much later the interest was there uh, uh, from much earlier on my mphil was on khadi before that i had worked in block printing uh, units um, uh, since uh, i saw it as a work uh, in family enterprise also so so these were like those uh, initial beginnings within this space right now um, so what i would like to cater on was about uh, will be in this discussion in this topic will be about clothing in general about jewelry in general about uh, the essence the 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 entire significance of clothing and jewelry which has changed over time like as the topic says the history of these uh, these the um, these integral part of our uh, daily being uh, now to begin with the question of when we say the question of what to wear now the question of what to wear has uh, occupied the human mind since time immemorial we all know this it's uh, uh, it uh, even uh, at the time of the humble fabric of khadi which was donned a uh, humble fabric of dhoti and gamcha which was being worn um, uh, within india and gradually stitch clothing came in so clothing is something which has existed like since um, since a very early time and we see that indian fashion has traversed a long way when we talk about indian clothes and jewelry so even during the darkest hours of colonial times light was seen in the weft and warp of khadi a symbol of self reliance that became the identity of indian fashion post independence we see that uh, there was again a lot of stress that was placed on preservation uh, on uh, skill set that was thriving within the country and newer policies newer ngos newer organizations were playing a role in conservation of these uh, now when we talk about the industry of clothing industry of jewelry industry of fashion um, they play a major role when in economic progress they form a very important part of the economic industry also why is it so important so there are many studies which have been done for instance uh, uh, one of the prominent uh, sociologists that i studied and i worked on was about george zimmel and his idea of fashion and his idea of fashion was very simple in his words fashion represents nothing more than one of the many forms of life by the aid of which we seek to combine in uniform spheres of activity the tendency towards social equalization with the desire of individual differentiation and change so there are two aspects there is differentiation and there is equalization and clothing helps you in achieving this so at times that uh, you want to be a part of a certain community you want to be a part of a certain group and clothing will be a mechanism for you to attain that so you you attain the idea of uh, social equality on the other hand sometimes you want to set yourself apart you uh, you want to be different so it's a very important tool of uh, differentiation again um, another sociologist goffman irving goffman according to him that uh, sometimes individual will act in a thoroughly calculating manner like you know whatever impression they want to give and uh, clothing and jewelry becomes a very important part of that impression making so throughout history it has been used in the, these contexts now uh, when i talk about bagru where my field uh, where my field work was where my study was and where i see the history of indian clothes changing and uh, traversing a traversing a route we i see that uh, bagru we have three communities these are the chipas the nilgars and the rangres chipa as the word says it is about the people who are involved in chapna chipa is chapna so these are the printers next you have the rangres who are the dyers who who are involved in dyeing of the fabric and of course then there are the nilgars who are involved in indigo dyeing now the production pattern if we talk about something and a block printing is one of the crafts amid so many in context of india right and again block printing itself happens differently there are different motors there are different colors in different parts of india even within rajasthan itself if you go to balotra the block printing will be different if you go to sanganer it will be something else so again in case of bagru the block printing is of a certain kind is, is of a certain nature and when we see when we uh, see the history we see that how earlier the chipas were involved in printing only a certain 
a certain kind of clothes certain kind of clothing right gradually uh, something like an apron being printed a tikozi being printed that is something which never crossed their mind earlier earlier it was the farads the lungri the lugris the uh, angochas the bichon the bichon the rajais these were being printed and from that to printing each and everything so that's a huge change in itself again a factory setup gradually the uh, the complementarity of a factory setup and domestic setup that came in with the history with, with, with as as the block printing moved on so now you have a something like a text craft um in bagru where you have a factory setup where you have a mechanized setup of block printing but at the same time you also see block printing happening within uh, within the four walls so it's it's a very interesting space to uh, see the tradition amalgamating with the with the modern techniques and that has happened over time again when you see that uh, there there was a certain situation of worry which happened when uh, there was the, when the mechanization came in when screen printing came in and that is something which not only block printing so but even all other crafts all crafts have undergone this concern they till today fight this concern and this is something that we will be coming to about uh, heritage crafts about heirloom crafts we'll be coming to that um now the the role of jaipur block is very interesting now jaipur block is the text craft that i'm talking about so there are a number of factories here in jaipur block you have uh, anokhi uh, having their own setup there you have ojas having its own setup rangotri have uh, these are the popular popular setups of jaipur block there are many more and uh, the workforce uh, uh, has increased the environmental conditions environmental safety standards have changed over time so how it would be happening within the domestic home and how it will be happening within the factory are different right because uh, uh, the treatment of water why this entire textcraft came up why jaipur block was made the main reason was about the water discharge was about the uh, water pollution so a lot of water is used in block printing the fabric is washed umpteen number of times to attain a certain color and uh, it, it, the water gets polluted and um, for example sanganer at a certain time had gone through severe crisis wherein there was major water problem due to block printing and the idea of this text craft was to um, to control this problem to a certain extent so you see that through history um, you see a lot of interlinkages you see interlinkage of the craft with the crafts person you see the interlinkage of the craft with the patrons so like earlier the patrons were say the royalty now the uh, printed fabric was being uh, 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 being worn by the uh, by the royalty for a certain reasons and they were the patrons gradually the patrons changed the government came in gradually newer entrepreneurs came in so the patrons have changed over time and a craft has always required patronage the aesthetics have changed over time so as i said that what kind of things are being printed that has changed what kind of motifs are being print uh, are being printed that has changed tremendously like earlier uh, there were only a certain motif for example motif of a babool um, i'm sure many of you would know a babool tree now a babool tree was printed and was worn only by the uh, older women of society of the community why because babool was a, is a is a very sturdy tree found generally in the arid regions in the arid and semi arid region and it's a really old tree so the idea was uh, an old woman who's experience who's who has seen life that life has hardened her so that uh, symbol can be worn only by her then something like a long cloak now clove you see all of us have seen a clove it's uh, uh it's like a flower uh, which has been tied on all three sides right so a clove is a symbol which was which was wore, which was worn a uh, printed fabric with clove uh, on it was worn only by unmarried women and the idea was because it shows fertility it shows something which has not been touched yet something which is still uh, still closed still uh, still safe now these things have changed over time the politics of entire clothing the politics of fashion has changed over time the idea of a designer that again is very interesting now earlier there was a patron there was the artisan where is this designer coming in now so that's a new that's a linkage which has happened over time that's the middle the middleman which has come in over time 
so there are a lot of um, uh, uh, areas that one uh, sees that uh, uh, one see changes in so it can be the the way craft is happening the printing that is done in terms of the symbols the colors that are being used for instance if i have to say like give a bit of a history of uh, uh, of block printing itself uh, there's a very interesting anecdote uh, like the idea is that when parshuram the brahmin he was slaying the kshatriyas two brothers of the warrior caste took refuge in temple of devi now one of these brothers bhausar threw himself on the image of the devi while the other brother he hid behind the devi and so we see that rangaris the three categories of uh, chipas the rangaris are the ones who descended from the brother who had slung himself on the devi while the chipas are the people who had hidden behind the devi so like chipna so these are very interesting anecdotes they're, they're very interesting legends in uh, context of uh, craft in context of block printing and this is again here we are talking of block printing i'm sure there's number of these in terms of indian clothing in general right for instance how it, it it's a very important marker of identity it's a very important marker of uh, belongingness i'm sure many of us have heard the phrase that uh, if you leave your clothing you you are leaving your identity apna aapka apne apni veshbhusha chhod di to aapne apna desh chhod diya so that is the idea for instance when gandhi uh, was leaving for abroad and he had changed he had worn like an entire suit boot like a barrister he was accused of uh, uh, of leaving his roots so such is the essence right uh, another again from gandhi's life only if i have to mention he was once invited at the buckingham palace and uh, he went in his usual style now this i'm talking about uh, uh, much after uh, like after the during the independence time so and when he went he went in his usual style he went wearing his loin cloth and uh, uh when he came out one of the reporters very um, uh uh in a very hasty manner in a very angst manner he asked gandhi that uh, how, how did you enter the palace like this aren't you uh, aren't you conscious aren't you ashamed that this is what you are wearing in the buckingham palace and gandhi said that uh, uh your king met me and he needs to think if he wants to meet me like this or not this is who i am but that wearing of khadi wearing of loin cloth at that time in buckingham palace was a weapon was a definition of for indian freedom and that was used very strongly by gandhi throughout the freedom movement so we see that how clothing um, since the entire era since the entire history has been used to communicate has been used as a very important uh, symbol has been used uh, uh, has been used to ex- to give meanings to change meanings to express identities to break down barriers to for instance uh, pakistan if i have to say uh, ghagra won the dark uh, the ghagra would not be uh, on the other hand again in terms of the uh, piping of the ghagra now there was a red piping with a uh, with a small yellow hem now this was worn by some someone who's just gotten married over time this piping would decrease right the red would become become narrower the the yellow would go missing from the widows uh, widows lehengas for instance so uh, this shows different uh, different facets of life it's like when you are not married your childhood your marriage your uh, motherhood your widowhood so how all these different aspects of life how are they symbolized through clothing and very important at that time today we might feel that why is it so important but uh, if you go through uh, back to that, that era when you couldn't see each other like the women were supposed to keep a veil till here you don't know who the woman is so it is only through her clothing it is only through those symbols that she's wearing that you knew that oh this woman this lady is belonging to a jat community to a gurjar community to a so and so to a kumhar for example uh, uh, the the symbol of a bucket that uh, when I'm, i don't know if many of us have, do wear it on a daily basis like this is a this is a flower here uh, there are symbols of baskets and that basket uh, at that time was worn only by women from the mali community like basket like they are collecting flowers they are collecting work uh, they are working in the garden so the basket was a symbol for them 
so uh, uh, so the symbols that they are these uh, ghagras these fabrics these uh, uh, this clothing carried always gave a meaning always communicated a meaning so there's a very interesting um, uh, um, um, cartoon also of uh, gagendranath tagore uh, and it says that uh, in in a train i don't have the cartoon with me and i'm really uh, sorry about it but that cartoon is of a man sitting in a train and he's changing uh, uh, he's shown wearing pants in the train he's wearing checked pants in a train and suddenly the tt you see the tt in the image and the tt is saying that uh, what are you doing this is a train and this man is saying that uh, i'm just about to i'm my stop is coming and i have to turn into a sahab sahab as in an english babu and uh, he's wearing the pants yeah. so it's like how clothing signifies meaning how um, jewelry is something which i'm sure my co-panelists will also take up uh, uh, eventually so i think i'll like to stick to uh, the space of uh, uh, clothing per se so there are a lot of uh, uh, more time if we have time i would like to go on otherwise i'll wrap it up shruti yes ma'am please go on okay thank you so thank you it's very difficult when you want to uh, say more and you have to just like bridge it quickly so uh, so I'll, like I, as i was saying there was different things about uh, uh, about motives like uh, how there's something like a borea motive how uh, borea is like a borla um, i'm sure like many of us wear it nowadays on a daily uh, in festivities and everything you wear a mantika you wear a borla now this borea was uh, when printed on fabric when printed on fabric was worn only by the uh, kumhar women by the women of the kumhar community kumhar community is a potter community because that borla is in a shape of a uh, of a pot like a, a of the clay pot right so that was worn only by them then you have something like a uh, the motif of a uh, of a bhalka print now bhalka print uh, as the name suggests bhalka is a sword kind of a print there's a arrow it's a very common print and uh, it's like an arrow with the uh, um with lines coming out of it and it show it's uh, it was worn earlier only by the lohar community by and who were the lohar community people were the iron workers so tokria print was uh, as i said were, was about the uh, the malis the so we see that how uh, how entire idea is that uh, when you are printing for instance uh, even um, even for the artisan even for the crafts person uh, the clothes that they are they are they are working on carries a certain meaning and even for the wearer it is carrying a certain meaning over time this has changed like today when when we go to a place like bagru which is a municipality district and you see that there is no you don't see women wearing those lehengas those ghagras or something which you are reading about or which you have you have heard of that aisa wahan pe aisa hoga ya aisa hota hai they are wearing your usual western wear they are wearing your usual clothes which you would be seeing in like say in a metro city and this is a huge change and there's digitization there is connectivity there is interlinkage of the entire world there are several reasons that we can attribute this change to uh the the idea of fast fashion the idea of uh, uh consuming consuming quickly wearing something and throwing it away renting things and wearing something else another time these ideas have come in up and this shows that how the the value of clothing has changed how earlier maybe there were few pieces which had a certain value which had a certain essence today you might have to you might raise questions on it that is it still there is that kind of a value still associated with a certain clothing maybe with heirlooms it is maybe with a uh, uh, skill uh, with handicrafts with uh, your uh, uh, your folk craft maybe it is but who is consuming this is a question that we need to ask and we need to see how this change in the history of indian clothes and jewelry how this change will go further how these things are going to shape now especially as i said especially in a world which is so closely connected where in some nothing is remained a secret after all nothing is remained a magic after all earlier certain colors were happening certain trends were happening only at a certain place that has changed 
So how this will also uh, change our attitude toward clothing, towards jewelry is something that we'll have to see with time. And uh, let's see how, how it goes about. So thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a really factual presentation and was very interesting to hear you speak. Next, I'd like to request Dr. Malini Divakala, ma'am, to present her views on today's topic. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, hi, uh, and uh, Ikta, that was a wonderful, uh, uh, you know, uh, start for the uh, for the uh, discussion, you know. And I would definitely take it from there. I would be more talking more on clothing, but basically clothing in form of textile, you know, textile of India. That is what I would be talking. So you've set the base right, you know. And I would I would say that you know I would start off by saying that you know in ornamentation in India is uh, ornamentation and adornment basically both of them have been significant factors in uh, Indian cultures. So India, the very word interestingly conveys its essence uh, as a nation that showcases uh, uh, incredible diversity, native traditions, uh, distinctive identities, basically, uh, indigenous cultures and an artistic complexity. So the combining of all these things is what we talk about in the culture of India, the landscape of India, basically. The color, the drape, the motif, the costume, and the jewelry, all of them have a unique value and recall. Art uh, in India is just a way of life, I feel. And the innate ritualistic customs that we all have associated with have defined adornment as a symbol of prosperity and uh, reverence. Uh, through auspicious beginning. So we, we, mo uh, every day morning as a ritual, you know, it starts off with cleaning the house, you know, especially in rural India, as if we look at, you know, as a tradition, that is what has happened. And so that is auspiciousness. That is what we considered as uh, wealth, uh, prosperity, bringing in positive energy into the uh, house. That is what we've always considered. So these morning acts of worship and con and cleansing and adorning are perceived as acts of well-being. Attention to adornment is a basic Indian element. Hence, we see that ornateness in its textiles, jewelry, or costumes. You know, you see any Indian, uh, whether it is an Indian uh, dress, Indian jewelry, you see that it's very ornate. It's not really very simplistic, but then it is very ornate and elaborate to a certain extent. So the once dominant uh, Vedic culture basically prescribed practices and that were embedded as cultural norms. We did certain things because it has been told to us. As per, as per our uh, Vedic uh, literature, you know, it has been told that this is how you were supposed to do things. So the traditions have emerged from these practices through those which showcase regional diversity often blend into homogeneous billets, like how um, uh, Ekta has been talking about you know what uh, how people wear what sort of jewelry they wear what sort of motifs each one wear it's the same thing wherever you go whether you go to north south east west maybe the practices are different but the philosophy or the understanding or the concept behind all of these is similar the incredibility of its diversity now lies within the oneness of these diverse practices which means that practices may be different, but the concept remains the same among various cultures. Ornament and adornment in India are significant aspects. A plain cloth is adorned with embroidery or a weave or a color. The floor is ornamented with a rangoli or a paint or even a haldi. Uh, then the wall is decorated with at some places with a mud, mud relief or a color or a paint, you know, or, or the textile arts basically all, almost have adorned many of the walls. The human body is always adorned with different types of clothing, different type of jewelry. Maybe it is tattoos, everything, you know, all these is all these are forms of adornment. And these elements have deep religious significance. And they perform various roles such as attracting positivity, identifying ethnic groups. Now, if you look at certain ethnic groups, you know, if we see um, a, a particular tribe, they're all dressed in a similar color. They are all wearing a similar sort of uh, clothing. They have a, a traditional way of uh, embroidering or, uh, you know, a particular color. That they, so they, it communicates their community. And, uh, and it also, now all these groups today 
are also supporting the society so uh, crops which have basically been uh, fostered uh, as uh, cultural crops today have become a living for many of these now when i say crops it necessarily need not be textile crops it could be a potter making uh, pottery it, it could be uh, embroidery embroidery making creating beautiful embroidered um, uh, fabrics it could be a printer it could be a jeweler it could be anybody who is actually contributing to the society by taking care of its needs and all the beliefs and customs have led to the formation of this rich vibrant indian landscape a landscape that today thrives on the vibrant sector of indian crafts and culture basically this is what has created the background of indian culture of importance within this is the indian handloom you know as to how a khadi has been um, uh, has fostered uh, oneness or the it's become the uh, fabric of freedom basically it handloom is a second largest sector of employment today the traditions of these textiles may have emerged from these local wisdom of the talented set of people who could be termed as weavers who could be termed as dyers who could be termed as embroiderers you know whatever they do you know this is everything has come from this local wisdom the uh, the aspect of natural dyeing that we were referring to as we as um, the first panelist was talking you know as to how printing has been done now printing was not done through chemical um, colors printing was done through natural colors now who taught them this particular uh, 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 science of natural coloring you know this this is pretty old this is ancestral they have learned it from their grandfathers and their grandfathers have learned it from their grandfathers that is how it has come in there were no there was no scientific um, records which prove that you know okay fine this is how it has to be mixed now everything there is a lot of herb uh, or herbs or min you know sorts of uh, things which were brought from jungles and that is how they have started doing this and uh, and basically that is how whether it is a bagru or a sanganer or whether it is a um, a bag or a kalamkari or any of these have come out of the indigenous knowledge or the local wisdom of these uh, dyers and craftsmen who have been there whether it is again once again if it is a weave you know how how intricate were our weaves you know how was the naksha prepared you know today we have a jacquard and a dobi which to a certain extent simplified but those have emerged from some indigenous sort of uh, uh, equipment that have been that has been used earlier so historically indian costume was essentially a drape but my discussion went on to fabrics because fabrics created that drape and it was these indian weaves these indian fabrics which created this particular sort of a uh, 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 a charm indian handloom products are as diverse and culturally rich as is the country what is woven is inseparable from where it is woven now banaras brocade we all know it is a banaras brocade it's a brocade but since it is worn in woven in banaras it's got its name from banaras as a brocade a kanjipuram you know kanjipuram is worn woven at kanj kanji in tamil nadu so that is a, so that is how these sorts of uh, textiles have emerged and the moment you see it you know it by place as so this is where it comes from it originates from because right from the motif which is there on it gives us that recall value of that particular textile uh coupled with the cultural significance these textiles have carved a range of niche specializations based on their appearance technique motif and color symbolism so now whatever we see in a kanjipuram saree actually if you visit a temple in uh, tamil nadu or if you in, visit the south indian temples all those motifs you see in these pillars of these temples so that is how things environment has inspired the weavers to experiment now if we talk about uh, the the uh, chins fabric where did chins come from you know today we all talk about it as a fashion fabric or the fabric which has created a lot of stir in the uh, 17th century 17th and the 18th centuries basically but what is uh, what is chins though it has got a different name as chins 
but it is nothing but it is a uh, indigenous knowledge which has been applied in the kalamkari technique i mean i would say kalamkari is also a later word but the actual word for it is vratapani vratapani meaning vrata meaning writing and pani meaning work in the native telugu language where it was done in shri kalahasti of andhra pradesh so that is how it had started but slowly it went on um, it it went global and when it went global people couldn't identify with these languages you know they, they we have many different languages you move from one place to other you know you know from from the andhra to tamil nadu then you, your language has changed from tamil nadu to karnataka the language has changed from karna and then it all the way it went to up the language has changed so people came up with their own terminologies of describing these um, textiles so that is how things moved and that is how chins has come chins though it has come as it it today is described as a uh, indo european fabric yes it is nothing but a kalamkari but the motifs are very different the visual language of this particular uh, uh, fabric is different from the actual kalamkari of ratapani which was supposed to be more of a religious um, sort of a uh, uh, motifs which were used later kalamkari also diversified majorly into uh, block printed style from painted to printed style so uh, a number of things have changed and so that is i think so that is what is transition and in modern india the while these weaves these techniques are all still mesmerizing culture has joined hands with trend or fashion and today is you see cultural fashion gaining a lot of ground as uh, Uh, as a uh, as a trend basically you know we see cultural fashion we see all the top labels whether it is national um, designers or international designers playing with indian textile crafts and when they playing with indian textile crafts while the indianness is being shown through the fabric the style has become more contemporized and when the style has become more contemporized we are catering it to a a newer audience uh whether it is an indian audience whether it is a global audience whoever it be we know we we need to lure them into this particular indianness which to a certain extent needs certain amount of a contemporization so i would stop here and hear the other uh, panelists talk thank you so much ma'am it was very insightful uh, next i'd like to request dr kruti dholakya ma'am to present her views on today's topic over to you ma'am thank you so much uh, thanks to mys for giving me this opportunity to have you here can i can we have the shared screen please uh yeah so uh on the topic what i am going to present is all uh, what quick examples or quick uh, episodes of female life stages uh, which associates with the uh, function of the garment or the cloth or the ornament uh, though i have taken a freedom to bring men into the picture wherever there is a special significance uh related to the clothing or the ornament of the uh, female or a male so uh, as malini dr malini divakala uh, rightly said uh, that it is all you know you change the language uh, regionally very we have a different languages regionally so uh, i think these proverbs are uh, very suitable over there which says kharo kharo pehrvesh olkhave desh so when you when you wear a right garment or a right cloth uh, it shows reveals the wearer's 
uh, identity in terms of the country or the region. And similarly, uh, the another one is Pahrwesh and Boli, Jhat uh, Pekholi, which says costumes and dialects or language reveals the caste. Uh, so I will follow up with the certain uh, few proverbs and then the, there is a pictorial uh, story. Uh, yeah, so there is one more proverb which says that Ek Noor Admi Hajar Noor Kapra. So which is uh, which we can translate is, you know, the one beauty in the men and the thousand in his clothes, uh, which is similar to the English saying God, God makes apparel and the apparel shapes. Uh, the next is Ek Hushna Admi Hajar Hushna Kapra, Lakh Hushna Zevar Karod Hushna Nakhra. Similarly, Ardha Vasnu Manvi, Vis Vasnu Lugru, which clearly says that the uh, importance of the cloth or the power of cloth is 40 times than that of the person. And that can be taken as a replica of, uh, you know, the English saying, which says clothes make a, make a man. Uh, the next is tu mujhe karta, main tujhe karusha. So if you have wore, uh, you, if you are wearing a right kind of a cloth, you can also uh, get the uh, identity or you can also represent as a shah is here representing the king. So this is here, uh, this is how it is the, you know, the personification power of the clothes have been shown over here. And uh, then there is a uh, next proverb is for the ornament jewelry, where it is said, Tum bina bayar hai aisi, bin pani ke kheti jaisi. So the woman without ornaments is like a field without water. And the last one which I am going to include today is, Tum bin bayar ki, uh, sorry, Tum bayar ki pat padave, uh, pat badave, Tum tujhe dhanvant kahave which says the ornaments excel the credit of a woman and proclaims a man to be, uh, a, a, you know, a prestigious or a wealthy or a rich. And uh, when I started thinking about various functions of the cloth and the, in the in, uh, early examples, uh, this the very first scene came to my mind is this. Uh, we all know it is, the, uh, it is about Draupadi Chidharan. So the dialogue before just this scene where the uh, servant goes to call Draupadi in the court and Draupadi says that I am not in a proper cloth, I am not uh, dressed up properly because I am in, a, in my monthly menstrual cycle. So I have cloth accordingly and which is not worth coming to the court. Uh, at that time, uh, that particular drape style of the uh, uh, Draupadi has been concluded by G.S. Gure as uh, Adhonivi or a Dhoti style uh, drape, which uh, where the entire uh, fabric has been consumed in draping the lower part of the body. And apparently he says that uh, so that the Draupadi's upper part was not covered. And that is why she requested that she cannot come to the court. So here, along with the, you know, the drape uh, uh, conveying uh, or the serving the function to uh, uh, comfortable drape during a particular time or uh, period of uh, month, uh, it is also conveying a message to the uh, family that she is going through a particular period. Uh, then the second scene which came to my mind uh, is, uh, uh, or the second episode which came to my mind is uh, uh, the Sita's uh, cloth which was given by, which was gifted by Devi Ansuya, where she says that this cloth will not get dirty, it will not uh, uh, give discomfort to you. So it led me to think that, uh, and it is, it is, show, it is mentioned that it, it was yellow colored cloth. So uh, that led me to think that it was the indication. So the, here the function was to indicate uh, about the tough time coming coming ahead, and uh, she was she would need such such kind of a cloth and yellow color, probably signifying the dying with haldi, the turmeric, uh, which has antibacterial property and all that, so that it, she uh, it will not get dirty. Uh, she will, she can wear it with the comfort. So probably uh, the fabric may be cotton, considering uh, the you know the 
uh, Lanka being a plateau in between the uh, sea. Uh, so this, are, this was my interpretation or this was my contextualization with that uh, story. Uh, then this is a very famous, a very popular, a very known scene from Ramanan Sagar's Mah uh, Ramayana. Uh, this is about when the uh, with the Ram's arrow, the Man Rani Mandodri's carnival that is earring, as well as the uh, Ravana's uh, crown, get fallen uh, by the Ram's arrow. So I think uh, so that is. Uh, so the this just before this 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 was the conversation in between Vibhishan and Lord Rama that where the Rama was wondering that from where this lightning reflection is coming and the Vibhishan is breaking this uh, uh, suspense that it is from the uh, Rani uh, Mandodri's carnival and from the Rav Lord Rav uh, I mean King Ravana's uh, crown. So uh, there the King Ravana was conveying the message to Ram that I am not. Uh, feared or I am not uh, no, scared by you reaching here in Lanka and in return Ram uh, conveys the message that I am here in Lanka so you should be scared and then the next episode ran into my mind was my uh, the experience during my doctoral research on Kutch embroidery so this both the upper garment called Kanchi uh, is from Ahir community. And here, as we can see, this left hand side garment is of a uh, uh, young unmarried girl where we do not see any uh, extra bust panel over here. Uh, whereas here, this is for the, uh, this is worn by the married woman. So here you can see the extra bust panel with a different color and it has a different kind of, uh, you know, gathers to provide a fullness. And they uh, often do embroidery around this bust portion, so in order to emphasize that area. And this is how the identity is being conveyed uh, that uh, through the cloth that the uh, the girl is not married or a young lady is married, as uh, rightly indicated in terms of the prints by the first speaker. Uh, then this is again uh, the left side is the Mutwa community Kanjri. This particular garment is called Kanjri, both of them, and the right side is of Sindhi Maiman. Uh, and if you see the previous examples also, uh, they are all with the raglan sleeves. So here, uh, and that uh, connected me when I was looking through this picture again. So this connected me to uh, the conversation I had uh, at Decathlon where the uh, personnel told me that uh, uh, for the badminton player uh, players, there is a that badminton players garments are the t-shirts are with the raglan sleeve because uh, they have to do a lot of uh, hand movement. So it provides comfort in that. Uh, so here also probably because they have to do a lot of uh, household chore where the there is a lot of hand movements are required. So it is very, very uh, comfortable. And apart from it, it is uh, if you see the layout uh, it, the, it is less uh, wastage of the fabric. Uh, then there is an example of Pelia uh, veil cloth, which is commonly seen worn by the uh, rural Rajasthan ladies who are the young mothers. And some, re some references also says that um, it is also been uh, worn specially by the uh, mother of the boy child. So here it is again message conveying uh, that this particular lady is a young mother or a mother of a boy child. And then here, uh, this left side uh, tie-dye piece is a, it's called Veer Bhet Bhat uh, Veil. So Veer is a brother, a Bhet is a gift and Bhat is design. So this particular uh, design was uh, gifted by brother to the sister. Uh, earlier during the Rakhi. So here the purpose is gift, the function is gift. Uh, and then, then this middle one is a gharchola, which has been gifted by uh, the groom, so gifted by groom to the bride. Uh, and it is being worn during the marriage ceremony by the bride over the paneta, which is again a specific kind of a sari, which is worn by the Gujarati uh, 
prime. And here again, uh, this is uh, by the Meghwal uh, community. Uh, this groom is from the Meghwal community in Kutch. So here is you can see Bokani, the headgear, uh, is embroidered, and this is embroidered by the bride, and it is gifted from bride to the bridegroom. So all these three textiles are, you know, the means of a uh, gifting. And here comes the Meghwal newly wedded. Uh, bride on the left side, uh, you can prominently see this round, big uh, nose uh, ring, nut, it is called. Uh, so, this has been worn uh, by the newly wedded uh, bride until they uh, give a birth to a first child. And after that, they can turn to this circular nose pin, which is called fullery. Similarly, this uh, uh, ladies from Haleputra, as well as Sindhi Maimon, they have to wear this uh, 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 nose ring, which is in which is worn in the middle of the uh, nose, which is very uh, unique and different as some you know compared to other communities as a symbol of marriage or as a symbol of adornment. Uh, and here, continuously, if you see, as we have discussed earlier, you will see the major part of the embroidery is been done on the bust uh, area and then as you go down following the gravitational law uh, you will see that the embroidery is reducing the quantum of embroidery is reducing and in meghwal community again the uh, embroidered kanjri is only uh, worn by the married woman and the unmarried women uh, do not wear embroidered uh, kanjri uh, and this is me. Uh, so here the beautiful part I would like to explain why I have included this particular picture is if you can see over here in the neck there is something white ball is uh, being seen and here also in the hand. So that white ball is made up of camphor and this uh, ornament is known as Kapoor Gajra. So this is I think the best example of how we adapt and uh, from various cult you know adjoining communities through cohabitation it was also seen during my cultural uh, my doctoral research so this particular kapoor gajra is not a part of my community but like uh, like i like the idea because uh, can we all know the um, characteristic of the and the benefit of the camphor like it uh, the smell of it Helps in help in relieving the stress during you know marriage because earlier the marriage were happening marriage celebrations were happening for four to five days uh, long so uh, and then uh, uh, there was unknown totally un unknown house where the bride has to go so that stress and that anxiety and nervousness this camphor smell would help in uh, getting away with all this and it will make you feel fresh. Uh, and the sari which I am wearing is, uh, I would say, uh, not a typical panetar, but it is still representing it because the uh, entire field is white, which has not been seen over here. And it has been woven by uh, uh, the weaver of Andhra Pradesh, Ikkat weaver of Andhra Pradesh. But if you can see the pattern, it is uh, the Ambadal pattern, which was very evidently seen in the textiles of Gujarat. And this veil cloth which I am wearing is at that time was in a trend uh, to give ad added decoration to the uh, and uh, uh, you know the look to the bride. And uh, here, uh, if you can see, uh, this is the uh, photograph from my parents' uh, wedding. He's my late father. And uh, if you see this flower, all the flower arrangement uh, uh, attire. So it was known as Kulshangar or Varshangar uh, and for the similar purpose to for the ad adornment or a decoration and the smell of the flower would uh, help you in feeling fresh and all. So uh, yeah, so this is my part of the story. I would say uh, some of the example which can spark, which can relate with uh, the viewers uh, and the audience's community. They can uh, recall their own examples. Uh, yeah, so I am done with it. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was very interesting, especially you sharing the significance of the ornaments. Thank you so much.
Next, I'd like to request Vikram Pandey, sir, to present your views on today's topic. Over to you, sir. Thank you. This was fascinating to hear uh, all the experts speaking about uh, various textiles. And my, uh, my subject of work has been largely based on some of the books I've written, which is about one was, uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, uh, The Footsteps of Ram, where we traveled from Ayodhya to Sri Lanka. And it was an amazing journey to see how Ramayana plays an important role in the not only in the psyche of Indian uh, Indians across from Ayodhya to uh, Sri Lanka, but also its influences in various other ways, which we probably do not realize uh, in our day-to-day -day, uh, life, but they play a role in uh, in textiles, in music. Uh, in fact, uh, in the uh, in the earlier session, uh, Dr. Kruti was talking about. Uh, some of the paintings. In fact, one of my uh, one of my uh, translations was on the book Raja Ravi Orma written by Ranjit Desai, and I could see some of the uh, paintings she was showing, especially about Dra Draupadi uh, Chirharan, uh, where Dushasan is pulling the uh, Draupadi's what, what she calls as Ekavastra. She's wearing a single drape, and in fact, that was something Dr. Malini also mentioned that our culture probably was about uh, just drapes and various other weaves uh, till we moved to a different uh, kind of a fashion. And when we were uh, researching on Ramayana, obviously it was difficult to find any direct evidences of, uh, you know, the kind of clothing people would have worn at that point in time, whether it was Ramayana or Mahabharata, two of the epics, and whether it is Sita Ma, uh, what uh, clothes did she wear? Uh, what jewelry did she carry? What was Lord Ram wearing? But some of these have been have been kind of consulted or found out from, uh, as Dr. Manlio was saying, if you look at the pillars of our temples, the motifs we have, uh, the sculptures across uh, various uh, various uh, uh, temples we find, and in fact, as I mentioned in the beginning, this was where Raja Ravi Varma also spent a lot of time. Uh, trying to actually uh, discover what were our original uh, textiles and jewelry and designs thousands of years back, because none of them is there in the recorded history. Even Ramayana and Mahabharata, while we consider them as itihas, uh, and definitely we believe so, because when I traveled all the way uh, during the journey of uh, Ramayana, we came across significant evidences in form of Indian culture, but not necessarily in form of an archaeological or a painting or some physical evidence which might be there from five or seven thousand years uh, when these events took place. A lot of people talk about Ramayana as around seven thousand years uh, before this around five thousand BC, and some people talk about Mahabharata in three thousand or four thousand BC. I'm not really sure, but there are various dates, but they are extremely old, but clearly that they happened. And another thing is that these are oral traditions which have been going on the Ram Katha is something which even today we see being followed across India, where people tell the story of Ramayana, of Lord Ram or Sita Ma or Lord Hanuman as how it happened thousands of years back. So while there is no actual evidence in terms of either a painting or a sculpture or a, any archaeological proof to show that these existed, we see the evidence of these in our day-to-day -day lives, whether it is in our culture, in our music, in, in, in the weaves, in the way it has got embedded into our day-to-day -day life. And very clearly, th this was a fascinating aspect for me to discover while we were writing the story or retelling the story of Ramayana by traveling to each of these places and actually looking at how they are integral to our culture, our society, of our way of living. So it was, uh, it was actually... As, as uh, Dr. Malini mentioned, it's not about, it's about ornaments and adornments. And clearly we find evidences of these mentioned in uh, Tulsi Ramayana uh, when, uh, as uh, Dr. Kruti was saying, that she was, Sita Ma was given uh, some jewelry when she came to uh, Chitrakoot. And we see evidence of that even when, uh, when Jatayu uh, tried to attack uh, Ravan who was kidnapping Sita Ma. And as she was traveling in the uh, in the aircraft, 
uh, she threw some of her ornaments down and even the ring which she carried was uh, was then used as an evidence to show to uh, you know hanuman carried that ring from lord ram to say that i am uh, representing lord ram and hence i am not somebody who is trying to uh, to cheat you and this is where sita maa then believed that hanuman was actually a messenger who has come from lord ram so we see a lot of these evidence in valmiki ramayan in tulsi ramayan ramcharit manas and various other ramayans uh, where and raja ravivarma of course did a fantastic job of actually then researching some of these from motifs from temples from sculptures and actually presenting them in some of the paint uh, photographs uh, dr kruti was trying to show i think we didn't see some of them in the uh, in the slides but i could i could see a couple of them uh, and uh, they have become strong influences uh, over the years uh, on on how we depict our culture and people have copied them and also become an integral part of our culture so i'm not going to take much of time i'll uh, probably uh, use that uh, uh, some of my points uh, in the q and a session uh, and already i think dr ekta dr malini and dr kruti have covered in great details introducing about uh, indian textiles weaves and some of the rich aspects we have and how it is now being copied uh, globally using art uh textiles and modern uh, designs on top of that so back to the panel for uh, further discussions thank you thank you so much sir it was very interesting to hear you speak so with this now we move on to our questions our round for today's segment and my first question is for dr ikta jain ma'am uh, so my question is when it comes to indian culture and specifically on the clothes we have tremendous shruti your voice is breaking i don't think we are able to hear that yeah i think the internet shall i repeat once again yes ma'am so my question is to you is when it comes to indian culture and specifically on the clothes we have witnessed tremendous transformation in indian fashion how do you see the future of indian clothes embracing its authenticity am i audible to you ma'am yes over to you thank you thank you shruti for the question thank you to all the panelists it was really lovely hearing each one of you there was so much uh, as a take away for me so thank you uh, about the question shruti uh, about how uh, when it comes to indian culture and clothes and the transformation this is something which i mentioned briefly uh, in the talk also that uh, uh, there is a major transformation and i think it, the question comes up at a very important and a crucial time because for us uh, past two years like what we are saying in context of each and everything the post pandemic area so post pandemic how is indian clothing industry how are the indian clothing traditions going to be perceived and going to uh, change becomes even more interesting right because during these two years you suddenly saw uh, one sees a, a, a burst of digital shopping for instance um lot of emphasis lot of uh, crowd going towards an online shopping uh, uh, medium and what 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 is is it how 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 does fashion come across through that online shopping right another is as uh, suddenly one sees the stress on organic like how one is uh, concerned about their health one is also concerned about the health of the planet and uh, fashion clothing they form a very integral part of this planet right so the idea of sustainability has creeped in so in terms of embracing uh, authenticity embracing indian fashion uh, maintaining the sustainability has become important so what earlier there was a phase in which fast fashion came up like a buzz and everybody wanted to uh, go and wear what is the latest gradually there's a shift towards slow fashion gradually you see the phrases like uh, eco friendly 
uh, you see phrases like uh, uh, something which is uh, ethical uh, ethical shopping ethical buyer uh, like what today one is more informed when you are picking up a piece of clothing by informed i mean that uh, they they know where is it coming from they know the process behind it like small small changes you see when you are seeing the garment when you are seeing the clo- piece of clothing there are these tags at times associated uh, uh, attached to the piece which ha- which share a short story of the artisan at times it's also a fashion um, uh, marketing uh, gimmick also it is a step and a stress towards uh, sustainability so the major change that i see in the transformation of indian fashion will will be to uh, uh, emphasize over this uh, um, idea of uh, climate uh, saving the cl- planet through with climate change through climate change uh, and uh, through fashion um, how do we see the uh, the the heritage craft the heritage traditions uh, falling into this uh, uh, this entire era that is something which uh, time will tell because uh, how do you see for example something like kalamkari something like pashmina how do you see them uh, uh, taking uh, taking this up how do you see their uh, transition into more modern designs uh, yet maintaining a, a, a stand of uh, being eco friendly being uh, um, uh, sustainable so that uh, will be i think is something that time will tell so there there definitely will be a change there definitely has been a change in terms of indian fashion and uh, uh, hopefully for the better thank like, you so uh, much recently uh, i just remember very recently there was an interview because uh, this is the day and age of what jo dikhta hai wo bikhta hai wala uh, era hai so very recently in an interview alia bhat a popular actor female actor she said uh, somebody said that uh, she was asked that you do not repeat your dresses so Uh, and she's just stopped that question in between and her instant response was are you mad why will i not repeat my dress who who keeps buying new dresses so that idea of a, um, uh, increasing shelf life that is coming from these influencers that is coming from these uh, media personalities and that is going to make an impact on uh, on the common public also hopefully so yeah yes ma'am thank you so much and my next question is for dr malini divakala ma'am and my question is globalization influenced indian fashion what is your opinion on that over to you ma'am okay uh, surely yes uh, globalization has influenced indian fashion and it should in fact that is uh, that's how you know in case if you Uh, you want a wider uh, audience you would want a wider market definitely we should be able to cater to those wider markets only when we cater to those wider markets that is when we are going to be we or we i means to say you know our artisans are going to have work how long will we just remain in basically doing what we have been doing we need we need to widen we need to contemporize there is a lot of need to uh, contemporize uh, crafts but that by contemporizing crafts i don't mean that it has to be diluted dilution is different from contemporizing contemporizing is about making it more more palatable to a wider or a global audience like suppose you know if we our crafts have always been in the rural setups in rural setups did uh, do we have the concept of table mats or table covers no we don't so people would not understanding but in urban india or a global market does know that importance of what uh, uh, what is lifestyle within the house what is the style which you need within an interior so we need to contemporize we need to globalize uh, we need to present our us our our tradition in a newer uh environments in to a newer taste why if we we don't even have to talk about globalization in the sense you know it, it going out of the country but you know the generation of uh different generations of people who are coming you know we are very sure we are not wearing what our grandmothers wore though we like what they wore we would wear it in our own way so the same thing with our children our grandchildren if we would want them to continue traditions i think so we need to contemporize it for them and so globalization is very important and that is how we need to offer a new range of things to to global audience 
I, I suppose I was able to address that question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. And my next question is for Dr. Kruti Dolakya, ma'am. So, Rig Veda provides details about the weaving process of those times. Indian mythology also reveals a lot about textiles. The Ramayana and Mahabharata have documented the existence of fabrics in that era. Could you please comment upon how the Indian epics interpreted ancient Indian fashion? Over to you, ma'am. You're muted, Shruti. So sorry. Uh, thank you, Shruti. Uh, so definitely in Rig Veda, the weavers are uh, mentioned as Vasovaya. And uh, when we see, uh, like in there, uh, even in Mahabharata, there was a mention of uh, existence of block printing. Uh, even uh, there is a references where uh, it says that uh, Sita received various fabrics in her trousseau, which was inclusive of silk, cotton, and wool. And it has uh, various colors, uh, particularly vermilion, red, and yellow. Uh, most, I mean, majorly present over there. And uh, there is an existence of various other colors during that particular period of time, uh, which includes the uh, red yellow blue black and all so and then there is a mention of uh, the weaving done uh, which has a pearl fringes uh, and in the time of mahabharata so i think these are some of the scattered uh, uh, fragments we get uh, if we have to mention as an indian fashion during that time uh, i hope i have addressed the question Thank you so much, ma'am. And my next question is for Vikrat Mande, sir. So modern times, we can see Indian culture has gained a worldwide platform, especially in the West. We have seen people worshipping Indian deities, embracing Indian culture. In your opinion, how do you think Indian culture and heritage has influenced the world? And why is it so famous in the Western countries? Over to you, sir. Yeah, one of the most striking examples of uh, Indian deity being, uh, you know, worshipped worldwide is recently, a few years back, uh, there was a uh, there was a lot of talk about CERN, uh, the uh, reactor in in Paris, uh, outside of Paris, where there's a six feet tall statue of Shiva, who is considered the maker and the destroyer. And that's what, while they were searching for the particle, it's about destruction and creation both, and nothing better represented than uh, than Shiva itself. So we see that Indian gods or deities are are seen or respected worldwide. The Sun was a classical example, uh, and uh, you know even some of the names like Maya are very easily uh, used in in various Western cultures, and that's because of the influence now as uh, Dr. Malini Dr. Eta was talking about how our garments, our fabric, our traditions, our weaves are reaching different parts of the world and adopted in, in a contemporary manner. But the essential textile or the garment is Indian, and many times the weave itself is Indian, but it might be portrayed in a in a in a in a modern uh, modern sense. So we have a rich history. If you go back to, and I'm slightly diverting from just Indian deities because India became popular even before, uh, you know, during the times of Vasco de Gama because India was known for its rich spices. So our culture of food, textiles, music, all of that has had a tradition of thousands of years, which today is now being globally, uh, you know, adopted in various ways. So we see the influence of Southeast Asia always was influenced very largely and Buddhism played a big role, which was an offshoot of Hinduism which went out and if you see meditation, which is now followed by so many millions of people across, has its origins in India. And yoga today has become very popular. Now we have an international yoga day. Uh, and we see a lot of these influences of Indian culture now becoming global. And textiles surely plays a significant role, though it might be interpreted in a modern way with modern 
uh, motifs, but following the Indian weaves and, uh, and and textiles which originated from from our country. And in, even in our country, we see as Dr. Malini is talking about, every state has uh, a different uh, government. And as Dr. Kruti was saying, even the Ramayana, we see mentions of these colors, these different types of clothes being used even five to seven thousand years back. So clearly, this is now uh, becoming uh, uh, something which globally people are adopting to and copying it from India. Thank you so much, sir. So with this, we now come to the end of our today's session. I would once again like to say that you are calling for submissions of stories, essays, and poems, and for project architecture and submission guidelines. Please visit our website, www.tellmeyourstory.biz. I extend a heartfelt thank you to Dr. Ikta Jain Ma'am, Dr. Malin Divakala Ma'am, Dr. Kruti Dholakya Ma'am, and Vikrant Pandey Sir for this wonderful and remarkable session. Thank you so much for joining us.